welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Hey everyone, this is Samantha Lilly, a science writer and suicidologist here at Madden America. I'm excited to share with you all MIA's most recent interview with Dr. Jennifer White. We'll be discussing everything and anything concerning suicide and suicidality, from an introduction to the Critical Suicide Studies Network to youth suicide and the complexity and difficulty that comes with. Thank you so much for listening. Enjoy. Jennifer White is a professor in the School of Child and Youth Care at the University of Victoria in British Columbia, Canada. With an MA in counseling psychology and an MD in educational leadership, Jennifer has practiced as a counselor, educator, researcher, and advocate. Jennifer served for seven years as the director of the Suicide Prevention Information Resource Center, Mental Health Evaluation and Community Consultation Unit in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of British Columbia. Her current research focus centers itself around contemporary discourses of youth suicide prevention, seeking alternatives to one-size-fits-all approaches. She is one of the original founders of the Critical Suicidology Network, a growing international network of scholars and advocates who explore alternatives to the biomedical understanding of suicidality. Hi, Jennifer. How's it going? I'm well. Hi, Sam. Good to be here with you. Incredible. So for those of our listeners uh, back at home, tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, what kind of work do you do? Just like a, a brief overview before we really get into some of the, the more nitty gritty questions. So I like to always begin by acknowledging that I'm a white settler here on the Lekwungen territory where I live in Victoria, BC. And beginning in that way helps to both situate me and put me in a context of colonization. Um, and I think that that's an important thing to not gloss over or just say it in passing and move on, but it implicates me um, in lots of ways in terms of my relationships with Indigenous peoples who um, are the first peoples of these lands. And I think when we, we name this, we are being explicit about the fact that Canada, and I think the same is for the United States, came into being through the dispossession and disavowal of Indigenous mm. sovereignty. And this is important to reckon with just um, as a citizen of the world, but I think it's relevant for suicide prevention as well, because I think one of the things I'm trying to do is to think more deeply about suicide through a broader sociopolitical, cultural, historical lens, uh, as opposed to just through a narrow biomedical framing. So that's the first thing I'd say about me, just sure. where I live and where I'm located. And then, as you mentioned in the intro, I'm a professor in the School of Child and Youth Care at UVic, and it's a professional school, and uh, we have undergrad and graduate degrees, and most of our students are going out to work with young people and families and communities, and um, we really think of our work as being strength-based and relational and trauma-informed, and we work a lot um, in the area of decolonization and um, anti-racism, and so all these frameworks um, that we try to mobilize when we're working with people are important kind of professional context for practice. And my own research, as you mentioned, is really about trying to understand what suicide is and that many of the questions I want to raise are about how might we think about it otherwise than the ways we've inherited to think about it. Mm -hmm. And then what does that give us in terms of a platforms for being more creative, um, being more expansive in the way we think about what's possible. And even lately, I've been thinking about even framing suicide as a problem might be limiting in a certain way. And so maybe there's ways we can think about it without automatically conflating it as a problem to, um, as and maybe it's more of a question. <laughs> That's maybe as much as you need to know about me to begin, and I'm sure we'll get into other stuff as we go. Absolutely, no. I think, and I'll um, I'll pose these two questions, and you can kind of choose which way to take it. I think first and foremost, we at Madden America are grateful for you and giving that like moment of owning the land that you're on, and so. With that in mind, I think it only makes sense to actually turn to one of the final questions I had on this questionnaire for you, which is I know that you were given recently money to do work with the First Nations people of Canada. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about that before we actually get into some of the deeper questions about youth suicide studies and the work that you do at UVic. 
Sure, sure. And I think um, like many um, colonial states, the Canada and the U.S. being examples, there are a number of, um, in Canada we have First Nations and Métis people who fall under the umbrella of um, Indigenous folks. And there's a number of very distinct nations across the country here in BC. I think there's over 200 um, different groups with different languages and different traditions. And so I think it's important to not again, homogenize or or have kind of a monolithic notion of what counts as an Indigenous person. But yes, um, I've had the great fortune of working for many years with some very dear uh, First Nations and Métis colleagues um, and friends. Um, And I don't even know how I began that work, but I think it was part of... um, a reckoning with the fact that here in Canada, like other places, Indigenous young people have disproportionately high rates of suicide re- relative to the general population. Um, and so it, 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 it invited us to think about, well, why might that be? And can we just use the same old sort of Western approaches that are based on, in many ways, evidence-based practices um, and ways of thinking about selves and ways of thinking about prevention? Can those things just be transported into um, an Indigenous context? And I think many of us thought, no, that's not possible. Mm. Um, And so I've learned so much from working alongside my Indigenous friends and colleagues and scholars. Um, And really, um, I think some of the biggest lessons I've had were about getting outside of this individualistic notion of a self. Um, Mm. So even thinking about what a self is in many Western contexts where we've inherited kind of ideas from the Enlightenment and the liberal humanist self that's this bounded, um, independent, autonomous kind of rational being is not the self that many Indigenous folks would say as the way of thinking about the self. So they have a, a very relational understanding and an all my relations view of a self that's deeply connected to the ancestors, to the land as living relations, to family and community. And so we can't even think in the same way about what a self is, let alone try to think about how to intervene um, with people who um, might be at risk in some way. Um, So the the work that I've been doing um, in this last year has been uh, about um, gathering the stories from communities themselves that they say themselves um, make a difference in creating the possibilities for life and for young people to engage with life. And mm. so we called it uh, Wise Practices uh, for Life Promotion. So we flipped thinking about suicide ah. and started talking about engagements with life. And we also flipped the knowledge that we thought was the most important, which was the knowledge of the community. Um, and we centered that knowledge and we said, these folks already know what's working well and is making a difference for them. And let's feature that on our website. Um, And in the background, I think we had a lot of kind of more scholarly work and publications that people could access if they wanted, but we centered um, Indigenous cultural ways of knowing and practices um, that made sense. So yeah, that's kind of a long-winded answer to that project, but... It's it's a perfect answer and and just such fantastic work. And so I guess moving forward with this idea of having these lived experience and these narratives so frequently disregarded and trying to center those, I also can't help but think about young people in the way that their lived experience of um, mental ill health and suicidality is so often disregarded or thought to be silly or unfit for their situation. And so I guess, can you, can you tell me a little bit as well, just more, uh, more broadly about youth suicide studies in the current landscape that exists? Um, within mainstream understandings of youth suicidology. Yeah, and I think there's a good connection there between kind of trying to work from a more decolonial framework when thinking about Indigenous suicide. I think we also have inherited an adultist kind of framework Mm. for thinking about suicide in general that we apply to young people. Um, And I think that's often predicated, as you say, on the idea that young people are fragile or they're not um, capable of making decisions um, on their own behalf. Um, Oftentimes our interventions can feel quite paternalistic um, and I've certainly been involved in youth suicide prevention efforts a long time ago, at the very beginning of my career, probably 30 years ago, 
where we'd go into classrooms and we would deliver a very standard package, which was, here's the warning signs, here's the risk factors, you memorize these things. And there was a very scripted sense of what was permissible to say, um, what was not uh, allowed to be uttered, and the kinds of questions that we would allow for. And there was a very clear narrative, which was, you know, if you're suicidal, you don't really want to die and that you need to get help from a trusted adult and this trusted adult will link you up with a professional or an expert who will then, you know, intervene. Um, and in some cases, that's probably life-saving for some young people. I've never been one to say that those things don't work for anyone. But what I've had a problem with is to suggest that those are the only ways that we mm. should be offering help. Um, because we know lots of young people don't a, avail themselves of the formal mental health services. And even if they do show up and get help, they don't stick around necessarily for very long. Um, so I always think it's important that we have a whole range of things um, to offer, uh, to mobilize, that map onto the young person's needs at the time and their own sense of what's going to be useful without us predetermining it always, um, what it's going to look like. Right. And so I guess, could you tell uh, some of our listeners, what are some of those harms that do in turn arise when this one-size-fits-all model is apply to some youth because I'm certain, as you said, and that like not to diminish how impactful some of these interventions may be for some people, but I guess, could you speak to some of the harms and the negative impact that these kinds of interventions can have on people? Well, I think one of the things that suicide prevention in the mainstream is very much rooted in a um, risk paradigm. And so everybody gets kind of read through this register of risk and pathology. And so we see it in the ways that we talk about risk factors and low, medium, and high risks, and that there are certain protocols that we're to follow um, when people fall into these factors. But of course, people are so much more than risk factors. Mm. Um, and in some ways, these ways of working can dehumanize people. Um, and create distance from the very people who can be most helpful. Um, and because of all the fear and anxiety that's attached to the topic of suicide, often when it comes up in the conversation, well-meaning adults um, feel afraid. And so mm -hmm. then we get this kind of message like, well, if you're ever worried about someone, call 911 you know, or go to the hospital, or, you know, if you're really worried, you know, and, and it ramps up something um, to a, a point of such heightened anxiety that there's no possibility for a helpful and hopeful and um, kind of exploratory conversation to happen when we kind of jump to that crisis response mode. Mm. So I think some of the limits of it are that it scripts young people as bundles of risk factors that need to be acted upon, um, you know, by another. So they become kind of like these objects to be acted upon or intervened upon. And I think it risks the very possibility of a creating a relational connection where you could have an honest, open conversation about what's leading someone to feel like they don't want to live anymore, what's going on. Let's try to understand that. But we, we put that category on something and then we're off to a whole other kind of crisis management mode. And sometimes those strategies can be quite coercive. People don't want to be in hospital. People don't want to have um, their freedoms taken away in some cases. And so it sounds like, and correct me if the this is maybe the wrong way to describe it, but what it sounds like is this one-size-fits-all approach, especially to youth suicide, whether, whether the, the youth like it or not, essentially funnels them through a system and the funnel may not fit them. And so we're exactly. just kind of, we're just kind of pushing people, we're pushing a circle into a square hole. Yeah. And I guess as one of the the leaders in, in critical suicide studies or this critical suicide suicidology network, can you talk a little bit about how this way of thinking about suicide and suicidality might alter that funnel or might make it fit more people? Your metaphor of the funnel is a good one because I think that is sort of what happens is because there is so much anxiety about the topic and the way that people are professionally trained to deal with it, there's this illusion of control that mm. we know what to do. 
Um, and so we, we feel like, okay, if someone's suicidal, I know what to do. I know that I assess them as this high of a risk and we send them off to a, another export or, or a more intensive kind of um, treatment context. And I guess what we in critical suicide studies are trying to disrupt is not just thinking about people in terms of their um, kind of risk, um, but seeing them as more than their risk factors. That's a part of what's going on. That's a circumstance, but also resituating their distress in a context. Mm. Um, and I think what mainstream suicidology often erases is the context of the experience of distress and suffering. Right. Um, it zeroes in on their interiority, on their feelings and on their histories and on their intentions and, we get very careful about asking, you know, are you thinking about suicide and how long have you been thinking about it and how are you going to kill yourself? And so we've got all these techniques we've learned to assess risk, which ignores a whole bunch of a person's humanity and experience. And sometimes that can lead people um, to feel heard and understood. And then again, I don't ever want to suggest that these things can't be useful. But for some people, for some young people, it feels like it's a closing down of possibilities, of ways to be human, because in some ways it signals people don't want to talk about suicide, killing yourself isn't an option, and um, there aren't things that we can even explore together about that option. We have to constantly be redirecting you to life, to living. Mm -hmm. um, and many people are writing about this in interesting ways recently, like there's this exhortation to live <laughs> and this requirement to live that we often also don't question in suicide prevention. We think, yes, everybody must live. Um, and I think it's good to interrupt some stutters into that question and say, yeah, do we want to start from there? Or do we want to start somewhere else? Is suicide a part of living? Yeah. And I feel like perhaps, and, and I'd love for you to speak more to this, perhaps what's missing from that question is like, indeed we may have an obligation to live but is that life deemed by this outside world world the societal context worthy of living which i guess is maybe the the opposite of the funnel is the funnel is like pushing somebody through this individual lot like this like one size fits all your suicidality is an internal when what it sounds like critical suicide studies is, is trying to say suicidality might actually be imposed onto the person because the societies don't value them or perhaps they don't know where their next paycheck is coming from and, and it makes their life more difficult to live. And it's a different way of placing the risk not inside the person, right? That mm -hmm. it's recognizing that there's other, as you say, other things external to the person uh, that might be contributing to the distress. And sometimes when you re- frame or rethink what's causing the pressure or the distress, sometimes people can feel like uh, there are things that they're up against that are not of their own making. And that can sometimes be quite helpful. It can give you a little bit of space to think, oh, okay, so it's not me necessarily that's the, the, the site of the problem or the only part of this problem. There's a whole context here. And it gives room in some ways um, for practices of solidarity, for involving other communities, um, for seeing it as a, as a site of resistance against injustice. Like there's a lot of ways we can think about suicide mm -hmm. um, as opposed to um, a form of pathology. And as I said earlier, like it can be a question, it can be a, a, a refusal can be a, right. say I, I refuse to live under these conditions you know there's lots of ways we can think about it that doesn't just only think about it as a as a psychopathological kind of condition indeed and and so i guess w with that being said these kinds of conversations about suicidality aren't ever really heard or talked about and i mean i i feel as though a lot of folks at home might think for good reason we don't we don't want to give you know, our young people, the, the, the wrong idea that suicide is an act of protest. And mm -hmm. I guess one of, the, one of the key questions that I feel a lot of critical suicidologists might receive as pushback is, well, what if they, what if they were just mentally ill? What if they were just depressed? Can't, can't they be saved? Mm 
Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and what's an answer that you'd give folks or what's a new way to think about suicidality that can even just take one step further into a critical thought rather than simply thinking this per- person is pathologized, this person is depressed. If we just get them out of that, they'll be okay. They'll, mm-hmm. they'll live a happy life. How do, we, how do we alter our thinking so that these kinds of critical conversations can become more mainstream? That's a great question, and I'm glad you asked it because I think what it helps me to reinforce is I don't think we want to get into a situation where we have it's either this or this. I mean, suicide is multiple and it's co constituted with our, um, co- you know, our contexts, our, our relationships with other people, mm-hmm. our histories. It can't be thought outside of a context. And so I don't want to get into a pattern where we say, well, mainstream suicidology thinks about it this way and we've got the answer. If only we were just thinking of it this way, we'll solve the problem. Mm. Because I think what we're attempting to do is just to create more possibilities and more room for creative ways so that there's a whole plethora of ways that we might think about it that we can respond um, in the moment. And so for young people who are experiencing symptoms of depression and they um, are encouraged to go get help at a mental health clinic and they get help either through CBT or DBT, which are often, you know, kind of thought of as evidence-based practices and that they benefit. I don't have any problem with that. I think that's great. And I think it's great that people are getting help and that it's matching what they need. Mm -hmm. But I think there are lots of folks for whom those practices don't work. Um, They don't feel like that feels like a good fit. And I'll just give you an example of someone I was speaking with recently who was in a DBT group and she kept saying, um, I want more to life than just being safe because there was a constant kind of thought thought about her safety plan. She was constantly Mm. being asked to create a safety plan and um, kind of assure people that she was safe. And she said that there's more to life than a safe life. And so this was just a good example of some of our tools and instruments that we think are helping people to stay alive. For her, felt like a diminishing of what's possible in the life she wanted to lead. Um, And that's, I think, just a small example of how our tools and the um, instruments and the practices that we have inherited do things. They actually have effects on people Mm -hmm. and they have effects on the therapeutic relationship. And so I guess I would say what we can do is to keep thinking about possibilities that expand our notions of what counts as a livable life. Um, We can continue to engage young people in meaningful conversations about that. Um, And I think we can also say what we have been doing so far is clearly not working. I mean, Mm. suicide rates are going up in many places, including in the States, or they're staying, you know, stable in other ways. We're not seeing dramatic declines despite all of the... Um, efforts where we've put into it. So I think that also opens up possibilities for uh, thinking about it in a different way. And I'm, I'm grateful for you mentioning this, this kind of reimagining or expansion of, of how suicide prevention can look or like how thinking about suicidality can change, especially with regard to the Critical Suicide Studies Network. Can you give us a brief overview of not only some of like the work that you're doing very specifically in this moment, as well as some of your your colleagues, wherever they may be in the world, um, what kind of work within critical suicide studies is being done to expand our there's notions some, of suicide? Yeah, there's, there's some great work and there are scholars all over the world that are, I think one could say, disenchanted with the mainstream approach to suicide prevention and they're looking for alternatives. Um, And I think one of the things we haven't talked about too much but it's important to mention is the inclusion of people with lived experience of suicidality. And I think that's something that Critical Suicide Studies is committed to. And again, even when we start thinking about people in terms of these identity categories, we get into this trap of thinking, well, they're a professional and they're a researcher and they're a counselor and this is the person with lived experience. But that's not how Mm. it works. People can have multiple identities. These aren't sharp boundaries between who the professionals are and who the people are with lived experience of suicide. And I think even that, the way we think about um, 
who um, are the service recipients um, and what it means to have lived experience of suicidality and how we hold that knowledge. All of these, I think, are part of what the Critical Suicide Studies Network is trying to um, acknowledge and make space for and invite people with that kind of no insider knowledge uh, to be part of the conversations in a meaningful, not tokenistic way. Right. Um, so I think that's an important uh, thing that we're doing. Um, we also came out with a, a an ethics statement that was kind of a draft that we wanted to circulate for input that conference we were supposed to have here in Vancouver in June got shut down because of COVID. But um, so we're trying to do things like that, like rethink what does a, um, an ethics in critical suicide studies mean and how do we want to work? And so we take a lot of account of the political um, context of people's lives, of um, forms of oppression, of intersectional identities. Um, we explicitly recognize that some people um, despite everybody's wishes um, for them to be alive, will continue to choose death. We, we, mm -hmm. we write that right into the ethics statement, which I think is important. Um, and I think the other thing that people are doing is, um, I mean, there's many examples of people doing amazing work in this area, whether it's around um, queer youth suicide or uh, austerity suicides or critiquing psychocentric views of suicide like even this language you can hear mm. um, how people are, are, are kind of trying to folk, shine the light in a different way uh, on what we might be able to do and in my own work right now I'm um, doing a study where I'm interviewing um, counselors who are working with young people who access mental health services because of suicidality and I'm really trying to elicit their own narratives about what sort of the standard approach that their organization and institution expects of them, and then what are they also doing at the same time? Mm. Um, because they each had this way of speaking about their practice, which was, well, here's the standard which I'm supposed to do, and then there's this other thing they're doing that I wanted to weight up with some significance that in many ways was a little bit less um, formal, less public, um, but had a kind of a critical quality to it where they were uh, working with young people um, in ways that were challenging some of these norms around, you know, what counts as a worthwhile life, for example. I think that that brings up a really crucial question for a lot of folks who do listen to the Madden America podcast and who read Madden America is at least one of the, the main goals is to reach clinicians and is to educate more mainstream clinicians that, you know, there are these critical approaches and there is research out there that, you know, shines a light in a different direction to what we so commonly believe. And I guess I'm, I'm curious, what role do you think critical suicidology plays to uh, like the fields of critical psychiatry and critical psychology? Because mm -hmm. indeed, at least when I first thought about it, I saw critical suicidology kind of as the end, like critical psychiatry and critical psychology came first. And then you moved down the timeline and then only then did critical suicidology come. And I feel like if anything that simultaneously repathologizes suicidality. And I, I'm, I'm curious what your, what your thoughts are on that and what role you think critical suicide studies truly plays in the field of in, in the, the broader fields of psychiatry and psychology? Well, this is something I think that we talk about quite a bit as our critical suicide studies network is we certainly don't want to be speaking into a space where we're just speaking to ourselves, you know, like, I mean, we, we definitely want to um, create possibilities for conversation across um, both clinical realms, researchers, people doing practice in communities. We've had poets, we've had arts-based um, activists. And I think it would be a shame if we just had another insular conversation where other people weren't able to participate and where we weren't able to have vital conversations about our differences and also possibilities for thinking together um, about what we might do differently. And I find... 
what helps me connect to clinicians. I mean, I have worked as a mental health clinician myself, so I have a, a certain understanding of that work, but also the, the structures that they're up against um, organizationally, the things that are set up as accreditation standards, the institutional requirements around documentation. Mm. I mean, these are things that people can't just ignore if they want to stay employed. <laughs> okay. um, so I, I think it's quite useful. And I've been in lots of conversations um, and workshops where we talk to practitioners about, you know, how their work is set up with these kind of constraints in some ways, but where there is an allowance for what I've started to become this kind of doubled practice where you're, you know, adhering to the standards and you're doing what's required and you're, you know, meeting the standards of care in a good way, an ethical way. But there's also this other kind of layer of practice where you're working, I think, in, 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 in a way that's um, kind of getting at some of these critical conversations with young people um, about what are they up against, and you ask different kinds of questions that position them differently, that doesn't position them as fragile, doesn't position them as, you know, discredited knowers, uh, but as capable, and that there's sites of solidarity that you can connect with them. So it's mm. just, I think it's just a way of artfully re- crafting the conversations um, and inviting young people into them as opposed to doing upon them. <laughs> right. So what are some examples of these questions that reinvite the autonomy of the young person that these clinicians and counselors do ask? If, yeah. If you, if you are able to tell us. A lot of times because young people are coming for counseling, they're able to see that there's a part of them that's wanting to get help. Sometimes even it's just they want to, their parents off their back, so they're willing to come. So that's a join. That's a possibility for joining. Um, and so they work very hard um, to try to understand what the goals are for the young person or what the kinds of lives they would like to be living. But I think there's also questions, and this come out of a lot of narrative therapy, where you can ask questions like, you know, with your suicide attempt, what are you taking a stand against? And so you're, you're asking um, about a values-related question, that they mm. care about something that in this world that they're living in right now is not forthcoming. And so it shifts the possibility for a different kind of conversation when you ask that versus when, when did you last try to kill yourself? How did you last try to kill yourself? You know, will you be safe between, you know, and those right. I'm not, again, I'm not saying they're not useful, but they become quite predictable for young people. They're a little bit stale because mm. they've been asked those many times if they've seen counselors. Those are the standard line of questioning. And many young people um, will say, do we have to go through those questions again? You know, can we just get on? With, right, a, it's right. with a more enlivening conversation. And some of those conversations need to be things that are fresh and offer a different way of thinking about the, themselves and the world. It sounds like what it's doing is it's just re, re-centering the context of their life. And I think, yeah. I think, I think that's beautiful and really excited to see the, the full fruition of the research. A question that I've always, you know, thought in the back of my head is, you know, youth suicide is so tricky. It, it's such a complex topic that how do you how do you broach it and do so in a way that that is ethical? And I guess if there are any parents at home listening to this, how would you how would you advise them to talk to their child about suicidality? whether it be their own child who is suicidal, their child who is asking about suicide and, and what that means, or if there was a suicide amongst their friend group or a suicide at school, what would, what would, you, what would you tell a parent to address suicidality in a way that, that does, does encourage context and reduces you know, the stale nature that suicide can so quickly become, especially with youth? Yeah, and I think it's become kind of proceduralized and that lends itself to this kind of instrumental set of questioning, which, as I said earlier, it's not very relational, it's not necessarily very humanizing, and it's not mm. a very interesting conversation to be part of. No. Um, so I'm always interested in the kinds of conversations that are driven by curiosity, um, that are driven by... Um, a sense of um, honest 
um, questioning about what's going on for someone without letting anxiety take over. And I think that's the hardest thing for parents or people who care about young people is when their fear and their anxiety gets the better of them. Sometimes that closes down the possibility for curiosity um, and a, a collaboratively generated conversation. But I think, you know, when young people feel like this is someone who I can actually have this open conversation with that acknowledges that suicide is a possibility and it is something that um, is part of our human existence um, to have thoughts of death and suicide. And some people do die that way. And so I think the more we close it down or disallow it or what I've written about in other places is smothering it, we smother the possibility for life itself to be expressed, which is a kind of a paradoxical thing. But many suicidal people will say that it, it is through the talking it over um, and being able to plan their own death or think it through with another person that they sometimes come to this desire to live again. And mm. it's not a technique. It's it's just sometimes when you're given permission to honestly exp express what you're feeling, you can kind of come to some different understandings for yourself. Mm. Yeah. And taking away the option, um, I think does something to the conversation that I don't think is helpful when we say even implicitly, I don't want to go there or let's not talk about that. Or mm. Yeah. And almost to, to touch back on this idea that, that you previously stated that's all the time humans think about life and death in this way. And then to smother the conversation around suicide seems to really smother a lot of ways our humanity. And that, that to me, I think, really kind of then leads to the question that you referenced at the, at the beginning of the interview that I'd love for you to just talk about and really just would love to just hear your thoughts and how you are currently thinking about whether or not suicide is a problem. Wow. Well, you know, what I'll say about that, Sam, is I think my own thinking has evolved so much over the course of my career. I mean, I've literally been working in suicide prevention for for over 30 years. And so I would have started out in a very traditional way and doing things by the book and, you know, producing documents that were evidence-based and transmitting knowledge from this expert place. I've done that. Um, and I think my own kind of um, questioning that ha has just been through my work with young people and seeing like this wasn't always what felt useful. It didn't always feel mm. like a useful conversation. And in some ways it positioned them in a way that I didn't feel good about, um, that I was the expert and I was telling them what they should and shouldn't do. And so um, I accepted then the idea that yes, all suicides should be prevented. I accepted that suicide was a problem that should be stopped. And I'm not sure that I've stopped thinking that it's um, a concern Mm -hmm. And I think that's the suffering that I'm concerned about that's wow. tied in with suicidality. And I wonder if there's a different response we can give to suffering um, that's maybe different from prevention, because prevention has this quality of stopping, mm -hmm. uh, disallowing, intervening, um, and there's maybe other ways of framing it uh, if we think about responding to suicide, mm. is, if, if suicide is a call or an uh, invitation or an offering of some possibility, an opening, um, when people make a suicide attempt, we're called to respond with curiosity mm. and um, kind of joint meaning-making about what, what does this mean? I can't assume I know what it means. And I'm not going to put it in a category, a predetermined category. Um, that that, to me, gestures toward the kind of world, I guess, that I want to be a part of, where right. um, we're recognizing each other's humanity, we're seeing each other, we're not putting people into categories where we say, I know who you are. 
without even having a conversation with you. Um, and changing the structures and the context and the forms of colonial violence and racism and trans misogyny and all the things mm. that we know uh, lead many people to feel distress and suffering. Like we've got to work at all those angles. Yeah, I think somewhat of a, of a perfect segue, but not to disregard the, the context of November 3rd, 2020, um, which is the day that this interview is being conducted is, you know, we're all anxiously waiting in the US and I know you're waiting in Victoria to at least see even the first turn of what the election could be. Um, and so with that being said is the US has recently been really charged with police violence. And it, it's, it is to say, or it's not to be disregarded that suicide and crisis intervention is a prominent topic in the United States with regard to police involvement in crisis situations. And I guess, what, what, are, what are your thoughts on, on, on police intervening in a suicide attempt? And do you see any place for police to be there? And, and if no, what's, what's a good way for us to begin to rethink, us being the U.S. or just mm-hmm. everywhere in the mm-hmm. world, um, mm-hmm. to rethink how to respond to an active suicide attempt? Yeah, and I mean, I I think we have our own cases here in Canada recently of uh, people being shot by police while they were ostensibly doing a wellness check on someone. It was an Indigenous woman recently. Mm. Um, And so, yeah, we have our own own disgraceful examples (laughs) of when people are supposed to be uh, showing up to show care and compassion that this kind of violence is taking place. And of course, it's particularly the case for racialized folks, Black, Indigenous, people of color. Uh, and and we on, only know too well with the recent examples that um, this kind of violence is not new for uh, racialized people. It's not something that they are just learning about now. It's been going on for centuries. Mm. And, and I think many white people are just awakening to it. Um, and many people are saying, well, how could you have not <laughs> been awakened to this before now? Right. Um, but I think this cultural moment that we're in with Black Lives Matter, um, Me Too, there's a number of forces, I think, that are coming together of possible sites of solidarity uh, of people saying, um, we need another way. We need another way to respond. And I don't think personally um, that the police are an appropriate um, uh, body of the state to be intervening when someone's in uh, a mental health crisis. Mm. Um, and I think that there are other models and other ways we can think about responding. And I think uh, peer support networks offer an awful lot Um of possibility in terms of being with in, in a way that's not so threatening. Um, and um, I, yeah, I just, I would like to feel hopeful. Um, but I know many people would say, you know, we don't want to go back to normal before COVID and even before this election result, because it was not that great for many people. Mm. Um, there was a lot of injustice and um, a lot of violence. Um, for folks. Um, so I, I'm not sure what's next or what's coming around the corner, but I feel a kind of a tentative hope. I want to say, um, that there's more possibilities for solidarity across groups that, that many people would say, and, and Vicki Reynolds calls them imperfect allies. Like they're Mm. not necessarily in alignment on every ideology, but enough of a uh, commitment to say we we want a a more just world Mm. uh, and we do not accept this kind of violence and racism. Yeah. Before I uh, close out the interview, is there anything specific that you think ought to be touched on and ought to be heard, heard by folks back home about critical suicide studies, about the current cultural moment as it relates to suicidality, um, before before I, you know, we sign yeah, off. Yeah, thank you for letting me just add something because I do think it's important to say that critical suicide studies itself has to turn the critical gaze on ourselves. And mm-hmm. 
we have to constantly be reflexive about what we're doing and what the effects of our doing are. Um, And I think we, I wrote something recently uh, about the need for us to also include um, people from um, the global South, more racialized black indigenous folks in our circles, in our conversations. Mm. And I think that that's an important move we need to make so that we don't continue to replicate a kind of Euro Western way of critique, which a lot of the theoretical resources are um, being drawn on by critical suicide studies scholars. And so I think we have work to do. And I think we need to constantly be problematizing our own positionality and um, where we need to go and how we need to be accountable. Um, So it's definitely not a perfect uh, arrangement. And I think we need to constantly be on the move and thinking what, 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 what we need to do to be accountable. Incredible. Well, thank you so much for all of these fantastic insights. I think if there's one takeaway that at least I have from the conversation, it's that you've been thinking and rethinking about suicidality for what, 30 plus years. And there's still so much more thinking that needs to be done. That that's really one of the key takeaways is there's never a time to think that we've figured out what it means to be human and what it means to desire to die and what it means to die by suicide. So for those of you listening at home, there's definitely, this is definitely a starting point for critical suicide studies and an introduction to suicidology itself. And if you're interested, there's multiple different avenues that we can connect you with here at Madden America. You can reach out to me personally, um, Samantha Lilly. And yeah, thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you, Sam. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.